Picture this. It's sometime in the 1800s, and in a dense rain squall, a big ship is fighting its way through the churning sea. But to the crew's horror, directly ahead, a huge shape materializes out of the mist, the bow of another ship coming right for them. There's a devastating crunch as the two vessels collide, and there can be no hope for rescue. This story must have played out countless times at sea through history, especially off the busy coastlines near the world's trading ports. And while there have been marked sea lanes for centuries, the ocean doesn't really have line markers, stop signs, or stoplights like your local highway. It took some serious thinking and coordination to come up with a system that would stop this exact kind of scenario from happening again and again. You've probably seen red or green lights on the side of a ship, or even on an airplane. But where did these colours come from, and why did we pick green and red? What's all those different lights mean, and how does it actually help ships safely navigate? Today, ships are virtually festooned with lights of all different kinds that do a lot of different jobs. They're part of a very clever system that allows other crews within eyesight to tell a lot about what that ship's doing just from a glance, but the system isn't always fail-safe. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend, Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to figure out just what ship's lights really mean. So, to understand why ships have the lights they do, what they mean, and how they can help, we need to take a look at some good old-fashioned history. For a long time now, ships have been equipped with white, red, and green navigation lights. Titanic, the most famous ship of all time, one we've talked about quite a bit, had them as well, of course. She had white mast lights and a white stern light, along with red and green side lights located near the navigation bridge. In James Cameron's Titanic, you can see a great shot of her starboard green navigation light when Captain Smith is inspecting the ship after the collision with the iceberg. And as it turns out, the laws and regulations that mandated these lights were actually in place decades before Titanic was even a thing. Port and starboard are concepts you're probably familiar with. In sailing terms, port refers to the ship's left-hand side, while starboard refers to the other. So the word starboard is thought to have come from Old English, which essentially meant uh, steerboard, where early helmsmen controlled the ship, steered it, with an oar or a paddle from the right-hand side of the vessel. Even after ships got centrally mounted rudders, though, the association stuck. Originally, from the Middle Ages, and right through the Age of Sail, the ship's left-hand side was called the larboard side, from the Middle English for laid side, where the ship would be laden, that is loaded with cargo. Presumably it was done that way so a ship could come alongside a quay without damaging the steering board over on the other side on the right. Now, there was a big problem here though, because in a roaring gale, or the heat of battle, you can imagine that starboard and larboard might just sound the same. So eventually larboard became known as port, and it hasn't changed since. At least, that's what we theorise anyway. In the old, old days, when ships still had four castles and fighting tops that made them look more like Teutonic castles, it would have been very difficult to keep fleets of fighting ships together at night without breaking formation, getting scattered over miles, or bumbling into each other. Inevitably, the solution came in the form of lamps, burning oil or tallow, which could be hitched to the ship's yards or her stern and be seen by friends nearby. That, at least, let others know there was a ship there, but what direction it was going in, and what exactly it was doing at all, remained, to observers far away, a complete mystery. Something obviously needed to be done about this. Through the 17th and the 18th centuries, ships still rigged lanterns at night if they wanted to be seen, but confusion could still abound. Lights spotted far off into the distance could suddenly turn out to not be far off in the distance at all, but mounted to a smaller sailing ship you and your vessel is about to smash straight into. In 1836, the Royal Navy had had enough. They decided to put some simple rules in place that the rest of the fleet could observe. They decided that ships needed to mark both sides independently with a colour-coded system. Red and green were chosen for this, and honestly I don't really know why, but we can make a few guesses. For one, red and green are on opposite ends of the visible colour spectrum, very likely not to be confused for one another. That is, of course, you are red-green colourblind. Of course, there are very few things on Earth that naturally glow green or crimson red, and both colours do really well at preserving our night vision. But whatever the reason, the very simple system worked, and it stuck. The Navy had great success, and soon all British ships, including merchant vessels, were built and fitted with red and green lights. The success of the system is down to its simplicity and a few key design choices. If you were sailing in the dark and saw this, red on the left, green on the right, 
then you could make the assumption that a ship was coming right at you. If from directly ahead you only saw green, then that would mean that there was a ship off in the distance heading across your bows from left to right. If you saw only red, then the opposite was true. So to make sure the port and starboard lights could only be seen from specific directions like this, they were fitted with screens that basically prevented the light from being cast where it shouldn't and confusing the image. But there was still a problem. If you looked into the darkness and saw this, a green light, then you'd know, as we said, the ship would be heading left to right. But without more visual clues, you'd be in for a surprise, because if we lighten things up a bit, you'd see that the ship is actually kind of on a collision course with you, so more needed to be done. Mast headlights did a huge deal of good when they were added into the mix. By putting another light, a simple white light, high up in the mast, then the direction of travel could be more easily ascertained, and a glance in the other ship's direction might provide some guidance on what was really going on off into the darkness. So with a precedent set for requiring navigation lights aboard ships, other nations soon followed suit. In 1846, the UK published the Steam Navigation Act. This enabled the Lord High Admiral to publish regulations stating that all seagoing steam vessels had to be equipped with lights. The Admiralty exercised its powers in 1848, requiring steam vessels to display green and red side lights, as well as a white mast headlight while sailing, and a single white light when anchored. The rest, as they say, is history. With navigation lights mandated, and the system now internationally recognised, safety at sea was vastly improved. See, in Titanic's day, ships were fitted with red and green and masthead lights, but they were also provided with a stern light. That way, even more information could be communicated to any other vessels nearby. Since red and green navigation lights could not be seen from astern or behind, the presence of a single low light could mean only that a small vessel was stopped in an anchor or that a bigger ship was steaming away from you. As with all things, the system wasn't perfect and there was still room for improvement. The world's oceans had long been split into vast sea lanes, just like a highway, but the rules that governed how ships should respond to one another needed some tweaking. You know that thing that happens where two people walk towards each other on the pavement or the sidewalk and they both start trying to dodge each other in the same direction? We've all done it. On the sidewalk, it's uncomfortable, but funny. At sea, it can be deadly. In 1972, there came a revolution with coal regs, the international regulations for preventing collision at sea, which stand as the rules of the road to this day. Naturally, the usage of lights plays a huge role in this set of 41 rules. In fact, the first few sets of rules cover definitions, sailing, safe speeds, and collision avoidance. We'll come back to that. But rules 22 through 30 specifically focus on lights on ships of all sizes and exactly how they need to be displayed. It's that important. For example, rule 22 on the visibility of lights makes it all quite clear that ships of certain lengths need to have their masthead, stern and side lights visible out to a number of miles. Rule 23 talks about powered vessels like crews and motor ships down to power boats, that they need to display a forward facing masthead light, a second masthead light higher up and further back, the red and green side lights and a stern light. Rule 21 gets even more granular. It tells us exactly how the lights need to be displayed. Remember I mentioned Titanic, that her lights had those screens to make sure the light could only be seen from her head and to the side? Well, Colregs goes into specifics on that exact point. Mast headlights need to be visible from dead ahead to 22 and a half degrees to either side and only that much. How about the red and green side lights? Well, the same, but with 112.5 degrees of arc over the horizon. It's a brilliant, simple system that virtually all floating registered vessels have to follow. So, armed with all that information, and with ships lit up nice and bright at night time, just how do ship captains use the lights to avoid collision? Well, looking out and seeing a ship's lights can tell the vessel's master an awful lot about what's going on out there, but of course radar and modern day communication systems are vastly more important for figuring out which ship is moving which way and why. The biggest ships, I'm talking about your immense couple of hundred thousand ton bolt carriers and tankers, they can take literal miles to stop. So ship's captains have to be thinking quite a few steps ahead. If there is any miscommunication or confusion, well, there's just nothing that can be done. Disaster will play out in slow motion. For example, take the Admiral Nikimov. She was a Soviet cruise ship that we covered on this channel a few months ago. She'd just departed on a pleasure cruise on a brilliantly clear night. Ahead and off to her starboard side were spotted the side and mainmast lights of a tanker, clearly bearing down on them but miles away. Now radio communication was established, and all should have been fine, 
but the tanker still slammed straight into the side of Nakimov and sent her to the bottom in just a few minutes, killing hundreds. Remember that thing I was talking about when people try to dodge each other on the sidewalk? Yeah. So there obviously needs to be a simple set of rules in place to prevent exactly this kind of thing from happening, and Colreg's authors were faced with the challenge of keeping things as simple as possible so that what applies to a 20-foot powerboat could apply to the 150,000-ton Queen Mary II. Colregs gives a simple solution. If two ships spot one another's masthead and side lights from ahead in clear conditions at nighttime, they both need to adjust their courses to the right, to starboard, so that they pass port to port, that is, red light to red light. But in many ways, a head-on approach like this is actually quite a simple situation to deal with. Where it can become most confusing is converging courses where one ship is trying to cut across the path of another. Now, this is the kind of situation that Admiral Nakimov found herself in, and Colregs handles it quite simply. The two ships involved in that kind of situation are instantly given specific roles. The first, the ship that has the other vessel on its starboard or right-hand side, and can therefore see the other ship's red port navigating light looking back at them, becomes the giveaway vessel. The other ship, which can see the giveaway vessel's green starboard navigation light off on their left, is designated as the stand-on vessel. Now the rules call for both ships to act as predictably as possible. The stand-on vessel is given a kind of right of way, so to begin with it maintains speed and course unless the skipper judges that the giveaway vessel isn't giving way. Now in return the giveaway vessel should slow down or alter course or both by veering slowly over to starboard to the right hand side and letting the stand-on ship ahead. But if it becomes clear that the giveaway vessel isn't giving way then the stand-on vessel has to take avoiding action, either slowing or turning off to starboard, but not to port unless absolutely necessary. Therefore, just veering away from the other ship. In general, turns to port or off to the left are discouraged in these scenarios because they can create confusion and they actually heighten the risk of collision. In low visibility though, things change completely. Simply put, Colreg's Rule 19 says there are no giveaway in Stand 2 vessels. Each ship has to take avoiding maneuvers by slowing well down and veering off to starboard making full use of radar, lights, signals, and horns. So, in a nutshell, that's why ships have red and green lights. It's part of a brilliant, simple system that's been refined since the early 1800s. It's a kind of language that all ship and boat skippers speak and hopefully know virtually by heart. But the truth is though, even with lights, nighttime navigation is really difficult. Without radar, it's hard to know exactly what it is that you're seeing but the lights and rules attached to them can give crew and their skippers some crucial clues. In fact, there's a whole slew of other light combinations that can be displayed to give even more information. For example, a ship that's run aground and stopped should run lights that look like this. Or a big ship that's not under command but is still underway, so for example, a big tanker whose rudder is locked up that can't stop, well, they need to be lit up like this, nice and red, so that everybody else knows to stay very far away. So to sum it all up, I'll leave you with this little poem from all the way back in 1867 that perfectly runs through the giveaway regulations that have remained little changed ever since. It goes like this. When both lights you see ahead, starboard turn and show your red. Green to green or red to red, perfect safety, go ahead. If to starboard red appears, it's your duty to keep clear, to act as judgment says is proper, to port or starboard, back or stop her. But when upon your port side is seen a vessel's starboard light of green, there's not so much for you to do, for green to port keeps clear of you. <laughs>